the grain, we look forward to Rohinton's presentation of the Gathas. Religion evokes more emotion and passion than relig uh, logical thought. In order to change, uh, to, to separate the chaff from the grain, we look forward to Rohinton's talk on the Gathas. May we begin? For the benefit of those who weren't here on the last occasion, I'll just give you a very brief idea of what happened. Last time we didn't in fact go to the book at all. I just gave a, an introductory lecture giving a brief historical background first and then the two basic prayers, Ashem and Yatha, their meanings, the Kasti prayer meaning with the basic fact that, and this is something that you all must remember throughout, that fortunately for us, Avesta is a part of the Indo-Iranian group of languages. And because it is part of this group of languages, we have a number of words which you will find in the Gathas, which are in modern day current usage in languages like English, Hindi, Gujarati. Now you might ask, how is English an Indo-Iranian language? Fortunately, Sir William Jones, who was a judge in Calcutta in the very, very early British time, in fact, in the time of Warren Hastings, was the father of modern linguistics. He is the man who discovered that in point of fact, if you reconstruct a language, Greek, Sir William Jones, Jones, if you reconstruct a particular language, the entire Western world as we know it all go back to what was called Proto-Indo-European, which is the mother of old Sanskrit. So, old Sanskrit is really the oldest daughter of this reconstructed scholastic language. And old Sanskrit's exact sister is Avesta, fortunately for us. So, I had told the people who were there last time that in fact, today perhaps because of this great discovery of Sir William Jones and a lot of work done post-discovery, we are probably able to understand what the Prophet said better than it was ever understood, except when the time when he actually spoke this. And if you keep this in mind throughout, you will find certain keywords. In fact, there will be keywords throughout, which will have some kind of reflection in one of our modern languages. And or you will have certain other keywords once you get used to the lingo here, which will repeat themselves. Now, once you are able, therefore, to get into the thought process within the Avesta language, I think you'll be able to truly discover what is meant here. Because the idea of these lectures is, in essence, to go through these verses, because there are about 200 odd verses here, and they are all arranged in a particular manner. They must have been arranged long after the death of the Prophet. But fortunately for us, we are able to, short of the last Gatha, tell you because of the content that what he said has come down to us almost intact. That according to me is a miracle by itself. The fact that somebody preached something at least 4,000 years ago and the fact that it has come down to you without interpolation is unbelievable. In fact, it is possible only because it follows a very strict meter and therefore very difficult to interpolate, number one. Number two, fortunately, when the Prophet spoke, there was no written language. So you had to con by rote and the fact that a large body of persons conned by rote or memorized these hymns made it clear that that body which went down through the ages was able to correctly tell us what exactly was stated by the Prophet. So this is the first amazing miracle according to me. 
The second miracle is even greater. That what he should say so many thousand years ago should be relevant today. Now, if you read the great work, the Rigveda, in the exact sister of Avastha, and the tenth mandala in particular, because it's in ten books, the tenth book is the last and in many ways the most interesting book. You will find that there are philosophical speculations by different seers. None of these speculations really would be something that you can try and live with today. It's very difficult. For example, you have a speculation as to who fashioned the universe. Now different seers came, seers came out with different answers. One said Vishwakarma did this and said it's like one huge famous architect actually fashioning it. One said Brahmanaspati did it. That is a person who, like a smithy, had a bellows and breathed into everything living. One said it was like a cosmic egg which gave birth, Hiranyagarbha. And there were speculations of this kind. Now, they are all very interesting to the scholar, but then today to try and live by something is, is very difficult to find in the 10th mandala. Now, as opposed to this, you will find in these gathas a person who tells you that he has been chosen for the first time. This is very interesting. He has been chosen by an almighty creator God for the first time to give a message which has hitherto been unheard from an outside source. This is the first most important thing you must realize. And therefore, the content of what he says, though the language is the same as that of the hymns used in the Rig Veda, completely different. And the content then will tell you that what has been revealed to this man for the first time has been revealed at different points of time whenever there have been times of trouble. And this is something also that the Gathas tell you. So what is interesting is that the key concepts to be found here are found in the later Judeo tradition, not earlier, then in the Christian tradition and in Islam. So you will find that anybody who says that he is a messenger as opposed to a saint or a great man or a holy man, the messenger will give you the exact picture of why you are here and where you are going and what the whole purpose of existence is. So what is interesting is he is the first to say so. The later Judean tradition tells us pretty much the same thing. One can say that was borrowed from us. But Christianity certainly wasn't. And what Christ says in a red letter Bible is pretty much the same as what Zoroaster said much, much before. In terms of eschatology, in terms of what is to come and the purpose of being here. And again, the Quran confirms pretty much what Christ says. So on the one hand, you have the revealed religions, so to speak. On the other hand, you have the religions which speak of persons who attain very great heights spiritually such as the Buddha, for example, or Mahavir, for example. And their visions, because they are not revelatory in nature, are very different. This is not to comment on whether their vision is better or worse, but only to tell you that any person who tells you that, look, I am only a messenger, this has not emanated from my own head, tells you pretty much the same thing. And with this short preparatory speech, I would exhort you again, if possible, to look at last time's lecture because it's been recorded. First get what the Ashem and the Yatha prayers mean. And maybe I should recap very shortly as to what they mean because others will never get on. What we said last time was that the Ashem Vahu prayer basically concerns itself with three concepts. Asha, which is truth. Ushta, which is happiness, which is born of light, illumination. And the concept of doing truth for its own sake. These are the three most important things. You don't do it because you are looking forward to something or you are scared of something. You do it because it's intrinsically good to be good and to be true. So, when you do it, 
you will get the happiness that is born of an illuminated mind. Interestingly, the colophon of the Yajashni, which is the 72 chapters which was compiled long, long after by priests, of which the Gathas form a part, specifically states there is no path other than the path of Asha. All others are false paths. Now, this is therefore crucial to an understanding of this faith because the emphasis upon truth and the antagonism to the lie is basic to this faith. Just as perhaps love is basic to Christianity, just as perhaps faith is basic to Judaism, here what is basic is the antagonism to the lie. And Herodotus also records in his histories that a Persian boy was taught only two things. One, how to ride a horse, and second, how to tell the truth at all times. This message has somehow or the other come down to us stragglers now of three great world empires. And that's something else that I touched upon last time. So, with this preferatory thing on Ashembo, we move on to Yathau Vedyo and then we come to the actual nitty-gritty that is contained in these great texts. The Yathau Vedyo prayer again divides itself into three parts. The first part I told you last time was an interplay between Ahu and Ratu, the two key words. Ahu is a person who is powerful. Any person who, who wields power, such as a minister, for example. Now, it says that just as this man is powerful and therefore people flock to him, don't forget, real power is wielded only by a Ratu, that is a person who follows the path of truth. So the first part only re-emphasizes the Ashambhav prayer. So you must remember that when you are enamored of persons because of power, and this is the old struggle in the Rig Veda, the struggle between Indra, which is power on the one hand, and ethics, Mitra and Varun on the other. The same thing, the same struggle you will find here in the opening of the Yathau Vedya. The Ahu versus the Ratu. And it tells you that it's the Ratu alone that you must try and emulate because he follows the path of truth. This is point one. The second part is that you will get mental gifts. You will get happiness. Only if you do good deeds in this life right now for love of Almighty God. This is the second most important part. And if you remember, Ahura Mazda is coined by the Prophet for the first time. Ahura is an emanation from the Rig Veda itself. It's equal to Asura. And I told you, Asura only means a lot. Mitra, Varun were described in the Rig Veda as great Asuras. So the Lord said, now there is only one Asura, no more. And that one Asura, I coin an expression for the first time to describe it. Mazda. Maz is like the English word majestic, great. And Da is creator. So, this is the only Lord who we worship now, who is the great creator, the be-all and end-all of everything. So, it is for this creator and for love of this creator that you do good deeds right now in this life. Only then will you be given mental gifts, what they are is in the Gathas. Again, another sort of reaffirmation of the first prayer. And the last is very interesting. Interplay between the words Vastarem and Drigu. A Vastarem in the old days was a herdsman, a shepherd. So a shepherd has a flock, fundamentally. So what they are trying to tell you is, when you are a shepherd and your flock contains persons who are in need, a Drigu is any person who is in need. He may be in need financially, he may be in need, in need psychologically, he may be in need in a million different ways that if you as shepherd cater to that need, the Lord as your shepherd will cater to yours. So these three parts of the Yathau Vario prayer were told to you last time. And with that, we will now progress and get straight away into the nitty-gritty of the language and the verses. At least I thought that instead of going from chapter 1, which is Yasna 28 onwards, it is better to first give you the two public sermons of Zoroaster. 
because there are two chapters which contain public sermons. Yasnaha 30, which is chapter number 3 in the first Aunavaiti Gata, is what we will concentrate upon immediately, followed by the greater sermon, which is in Yasnaha 45, which is equally the third chapter of the second Gata, the Uttavaiti Gata. Why do I call it the greater sermon? Because in the very opening, Zoresta lets us know that the message has now spread far and wide. So he tells people, those who are here, as well as those who have come from afar. So we know, therefore, that it's a sermon that is now intended for mankind, as he saw it. With these prefatory remarks, would all of you be kind enough to turn to page 115 of the books that you have, which is the translation of Eret Staraporwala, called the, either the Gathas or the religion of Zarathustra, depending upon who is published which book. And why I have chosen this in particular over other translations is that you have a word-for-word -word rendering so that it gives you some idea of what the Avestan words in each of these things mean. Now, it starts with something which is an Avestan word which is repeated constantly, vaksya. Please mark it because it means to speak. And isento, for example, the English word wish is you wish for something. As we go along, we'll keep giving you clues like this. So, and the word da could have been in place of the word ta. Atta. Because da means to. Uh, the truakatra. So, when it says at ta, ta means to. I will speak of those who had certain wishes themselves and who were created by God, Mazda Data. Yet you have come across in the Asham Bau prayer, if you remember. Yad Ashai. Correct? So yet basically is a preposition. This. And what is important? Yet. Number seven. We can go according to numbers also. Number seven. All right. Yes, sir. See, just, just please now concentrate, huh? because it's going to be a little difficult. Concentrate now. The second word is ta. Have you got it? Right. What I told you was it could possibly be da, because the idea is to tell you of two spirits. Uh, the. Right? In many languages world over, the word to begins with D, the expression D, da. All right? Vaksya, I told you, this is the third word, is to speak. Vacho, vaksya, etc. Vacho is the word used continuously. Isento, I told you, is wish, basically. So it is translated here as those who are eager. Eager is, a, is perhaps a way of doing it. But the idea is, they, there's some wish in the eagerness. And Mazdata, Mazdata, is created by Mazda. Yet, again, number seven, is in the Ashembau prayer itself. Chit and Vidushe are very important. Vidushe is something used in modern day Sanskrit, Hindi, etc. Right? So, Basically, it means those who are wise. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I said it's in modern day usage. So, you will find already isento, there is something in modern day usage. Vidushe, there is something in modern day usage. This is how I want you to connect. All right? And it therefore says, I will speak of two spirits. All this is meant for those who are genuine seekers. That's why he says, I wish to speak only to those who are wise. They want to move on in life. Then he says, 
I will stauta basically is really praise, hymns of praise. So I will praise Ahura, who is God. And I will also praise Vangehush Manangao. Now we have already come across Vangehush Manangao in the Yatha video prayer. Correct? Man, mind. Vangehush, behest, best, highest. And then the last part, who mazdra, remember that the preposition who always means good. You will find it throughout. Who jato is, for example, good living, good living. Who urvatat, when you are talking of a person who is whole, good. So it basically means good. Mazdra is a prayer. So, when it says, I shall explain prayers that are made to Asha, which is truth, if you remember. Only then will you grow mentally, because the word Urvaza is very important, the last word. Urvaza means to grow, to wax as opposed to wane. All right. Only then will you attain realms of light. Rauche is light. So, what the prophet is telling you in the opening sermon is that I will talk to those who genuinely wish to know about the twin spirits which are coming in the next verses. I will weave my hymns to Almighty God and to Asha And ultimately, the idea of all prayer is to be able to grow in realms of light. Therefore, your mind grows as it gets more and more illuminated. So this is verse 1. Now you come to verse 2. See, all this necessarily means that there is a lot of homework to do. Because this is only a very introductory, preparatory thing. After you people have done this, you come back and question it again next Sunday. Now verse 2 says, again, srauta is the word sarosh. All of you are familiar with the word sarosh. What does sarosh mean? Sarosh basically means to hear your own inner voice. Sru, sru, conscience. The verb is sru, to hear from within. Basically, it means to hear from within. So, and Gaussais is simple because it is with your ears. You hear with your ears. Vahista is what I am about to tell you, which is highest or best. You have already come across Vahista, third word. Then, Avainata is consider. Sucha. Again, in some modern languages, Sucha, something pure. Swach, so that you get some idea, you know. Man again, same thing, mananga. So consider this with your mind in as pure a fashion, as clear a fashion as possible. Now very important, avarena. Varena means the, the faculty of choice that the Lord has given us. So, choose, very important, vichithaya before deciding. And now comes a very beautiful line, man for man, na means a man. So, man for man, man for man, each for his own self. Tanuye, tan, what is tan? Tan is body, correct? Rohin tan. Tanuye, for his own self. And Svak says his own. So each of you apply your own minds, choose for yourself. Very important. Before the great new age will be ushered in by me, because I have come here, Zarathustra, to completely revolutionize society. 
सो आई हैव कम पारा मजे अगेन इज द सेम मजेस्टिक मजे मोटो बिग यंगो इज न्यू एज सो बिफोर दिस ग्रेट न्यू एज इज अशर्ड इन प्लीज वेक अप बहुदंतो इज वेक अप वर्ड नंबर नाइनटीन वन नाइन to this teaching sasdhyaya number 18 is teaching and paithi is each one for his own self again so once this becomes clear and you put everything together then you read the word for word and you read the running translation and make sense for it of it for yourself all right so what is very important is he is telling you here that each of us have been given moral choice please choose there are two diametrically opposite paths choose for your own self don't choose because somebody tells you and do it with an open clear mind and please wake up to this message otherwise there will be trouble for you all right this is verse 2 now we move on to 3 now here are the great allegorical twin spirits who were there from the beginning of time and before i read this verse it is important here to note that in the gathas there is no devil please remember that there is only god who is sevistai the word used is sevistai throughout which means almighty god is in complete control of everything there is no devil and angra mainyu is a creation of god who is a mind who has a mind like us mainyu man who has chosen wrongly that's all it means so throughout here you will find that evil is parasitical upon good it doesn't exist by itself very important to learn this basic thing that he is trying to din into us over and over and over again and you will find it throughout that there is no embodiment of evil the evil is within you and evil is what wrong moral choice nothing more nothing less all right so we carry on now with verse 3 at ta mainyu again ta or da depending because there are two spirits pauru ye means in the very beginning so at the very beginning of time these two spirits were created now what is interesting is the next word yema means twins so they are alike in every way they are even given the same power of choice one chooses correctly one chooses incorrectly very important there's no distinction they have been created exactly alike so ya yema twins swafena arswatam that means they had revealed themselves and they got on extremely well together they worked beautifully together no problem and they were exactly alike however manaicha vachaicha you remember vach speak shotnoy shotananam yatha overyo deeds these words will repeat themselves so in thought word and deed they are vahyo and akem vahyo good akem bad clear distinction then you have a very interesting word as word 20 eres it will keep coming it's the same as the english word erect erect straight from straight you get truth is it 21 20 number 20 so ascha hudanga ho who again you remember is good who will appear constantly as a prefix which only means good dango is somebody who follows a particular good philosophy daina which is thought so basically somebody who thinks 
correctly. Eres is upright, erect, upright, therefore true. Visyata again is the choice faculty to choose. So what he is telling you here is, of these two, those who think correctly choose what is good, those who do not choose what is not correct or what is bad. So this verse again is beautiful because it tells you there is no meeting point between good and evil. It's a very clear, clear cut. Most prophets speak very clearly to you. Very clear cut philosophy. He tells you also, don't forget, in every way these spirits have been created equal. They got on exceptionally well with each other also. But don't forget, one chose this way, one chose the other. And if you think in the manner which he wants you to think as the verses go along, then you will choose aright and not choose, not go astray. So this is verse 3. Now come to verse 4. This is another very, very interesting verse. Now again he says, in the very beginning, when these two minus, minds, got together, him, word number five, Paurvim, again you remember, we have come across the word Pauru, Paurvim, Paur, beginning. They did something which was very interesting. Does they means they in turn created something. What did they create? They created life, Gaimcha. Gaim appears all the time. Gaya, for example, in the word in Greek also, means nothing other than earth or the goddess of earth. Same meaning. So Gaya is basically earth, life. And Ajaitim becomes even more important. Jaitim is what? Jivanu. To live. Ajay means to oppose what is living. So, what they are telling you here is, what did they do? When they got together, they created life and its destruction. Because when you oppose life, what do you do? You destroy. So, the translation not life is unhappy. Number 12. There is opposition to life, which means destruction. So what did they do when they got together? They created life and they created a destruction of life. And thus will life's purpose be fulfilled. The next words are very, very important. Apemem is the key word, number 17. Purpose. There is a purpose now. And that purpose is very, very clear. The worst to those who choose wrongly and to those who are ashaune, that is persons who live by truth, vaistam mano, which we have come across repeatedly equally in the yatha vario plan. So, this verse again tells you very beautifully that the two spirits have got together and what did they do from the very beginning? One fostered life, one destroyed life. And you must choose a right, because if you choose alongside the destroyer, you in turn will get destroyed. It is telling you very clearly that the worst alone will come to you. And the worst what? Mentally. Everything here is mental, it's very important. So you will be in grave danger mentally as opposed to somebody who lives by truth. Then five, again a reaffirmation. Of these spirits, as, you see spirit again is a loose translation, it's like a mind. Any, any mind which is not encaged in a human body, it's a mind, the thought faculty. So again, varta, varan, choose, choice. Word number three. So of these mainiva spirits, 
did choose. Again, Dregva is somebody who chooses something which is false. Dregva means false as opposed to true. Achista, worst, five and six. And Varesio means doing. So therefore, what did they do? They did the worst since they chose wrongly, worst deeds. But the Holy Spirit, who is the Spenista menu, because throughout you will find Spenta and Angra menu. These are the opposing menus. They are described throughout the Gathas as Spenta beneficial and Angra that which opposes life. For Angra, again, you can perhaps go to the English word anger because Aishma really means anger. But the idea generally that is conveyed is that somebody is doing something which is nasty as opposed to something good. And then the next line say, yes, rouse this thing, asheno vaste. Rouse this thing means strong, extremely strong. Ashenovaste, light imperishable. And whoso would please Almighty God, Aura. Very important again, the emphasis is on deeds throughout. Haithiais only means truth. Shyautnais again is Shyautanana. Yatao Word number 20. So therefore, through deeds of truth, he chooses Almighty God, or the way to God. Verse 6. Now we come down to those who are living. Daivas. Who are those who are daivas? Persons who believe in many gods. So this again is strictly monotheistic. The faith is strictly monotheistic. All the old gods have been thrown over. So it says... Eres again appears, word number 3 in 30.6. Erect, upright. So, noit, again, noit is so obvious. Correct? Noit means no. Same English, if you, if you remove it, it is no. Yes. So, of these two, those who worship many gods, now he is going down to people who are probably members of the old faith because he's come as a revolutionary, he's throwing it over. So those who worship many gods, and in the Rigveda, if you remember, they were nature gods basically. Together with one or two human beings who perhaps became apotheized as they went down the line, Indra for example. So he says, if you worship and those who worship many gods, Delude themselves. Debaumma is a very important word. Word number 10. Yeah, delude. And you delude yourself the moment you are in doubt. Again, very important. Peres maning really means to keep disputing. Maning is again mind. Peres is to dispute. Word number 11. And thus they chose. You see, the emphasis throughout is whatever you do wrong, you have done for yourself. You have chosen. Yet Varenata, again, Varan. Word number 15, 1 5. What did you choose? Achista. It's come now for the third or fourth time already. Worst. Man. Mind. And now you come to the word Aishma. 
which is word number 19. Anger, wrath. This is a very beautiful thing. They are rushing to their own destruction. All these angry people. Dvarenta means to rush. And again in word 23 you have an English word. Banayan. Binful. Ban. Bin. Binful. Ahum Maretano. Maretano is like our first man, Gayo Maretan. Why was he called Gayo Maretan? Because he is life that is doomed to death. Gayo means life. Marwanu. Tan. Person. So a person who is born to die. So all of us are Maretans, mortals. Same English word. So far so good or any problems? All right. We move on. Seven. Yeah. No, no. No, there's no connection. What it says is, we are all born to die. Every one of us, whether we are good or bad, we are all Maritans. Every one of us. What will happen after we die is going to come, which is very important. There, there is no, absolutely no connection. Everyone will die, but how you are to conduct yourself on earth is the whole, whole idea in these hymns. And where you are going and why you are going is all going to come. Then comes verse 7. Now, the third word is Shatra. Again, it repeats itself all the time throughout in the Gathas. The same word in Yatha Overyo. Shatrem Cha Augurai. You remember? Last part. Correct? Shatra only means strength, power. Word number 3 in verse 7. It will come repeatedly. So what it tells you is, the moment you live correctly, what will come to you, that's the last part, this is like a reaffirmation of the Yatha where you oppress. The Lord's own strength will come and succor you. Is it? So, it says, unto such shall come Shatra, Vahumana and Asha. These are all considered as archangels in later Zoroastrianism. All considered Yazatas. The embodiment of truth, Asha. The embodiment of the highest that the mind can attain, Vahumana. And then Shatra. So all three of them, you draw to yourself when you live along the path of truth. And this is very interesting. Kerpem. The word Kerpem, number 10. Corpus. The English word corpus. Body. Is it? So, at Kerpem. Uttayuitis. Now, please mark the word Uttayuitis, which is word number 11. It will again repeat, it, repeat itself throughout the Gathas. Uttayuiti basically means to renew. So, it will say, and it's, it's a beautiful translation here, the idea is to continually therefore renew yourself, that is to progress. So continued progress of bodies like us will our mighty grant. Now our mighty again is a key word which you must never forget, number 13. So far there are four or five key words that have occurred. Asha, truth, vahumana, highest mind, shatra, the Lord's strength, fourth is armaiti. Again, maiti is man, ar is right. So to think right, armaiti. You see, all of these are regarded as archangels because when a conference in heaven takes place, interestingly enough, 
in the second chapter of the Aunavad Gatha, that is chapter 29, which we'll come to. Each of these is spoken to by God as an embodiment of truth, embodied. so they are regarded as angels in themselves. So the Lord speaks to Asha, tells Asha to find somebody because the soul of earth is crying away and saying, listen, there is rapine, terror, hell going on. Send us a savior. So God has a conference in heaven and talks to Asha, who is an archangel, and says, come on, I have appointed you to look after these people. What are you doing? And Asha replies saying, look, I am doing my best, but I don't find anybody that they seem to want. So the Lord then turns to Vahumana, number two. Again, as an embodiment of the highest that a mind can have. And Vahumana turns around and says, yes, I have found somebody. And that somebody is Zoroaster. And having found Zoroaster, we will send him down in order to patch up everything that's going wrong. And the earth shouts back and says, what is this? You have sent me some cowardly little human being. I am not asking for this. I am asking for some strong person to deal with all these guys. And finally, the earth realizes that it is he alone who will now have this great reformation through word of mouth and then accepts it. This great word of mouth, you see, so that Zoroaster is sent down on earth for nothing more and nothing less than a complete upheaval of what has happened. Now all this was only an answer to your question because these are all treated as divinities on their own in at least this chapter. No, they are very different. I tell you how they are different. They are different because Vahu Mana is the highest that the mind can achieve. How do you achieve it? Means and ends. Means and ends. Vahu Mana is the end. Armaite is the means. Means. So we come back now to verse 7. We stopped at this continuous progress of the corpus, Kerpem. Does right mindedness grant? Armaiti is right minded. And then Aisham Toya Angat. Angat is will, future. Now, what is interesting is the word Ayanga, number 20. Ayanga is like the English word iron, metal. Adanais is ordeal. And you remember the word Pauru, it's come again in number 22. First. So, it tells you that when you follow the path of Asha, when you follow the path of right mindedness, you are going to go through one hell of an ordeal, which is like the ordeal or the molten metal test, as it was known then. So you will, be, you will actually go through hell before you ultimately emerge and get all these great gifts. So this is a very important verse. Yes. So the path of Asha is strewn with boulders and hell along it, is what they are telling you here. Then 30.8. Now, this is a retribution verse, eight, number 8, page 122. And here, again, the key word is kaina, number 5. The word is retribution, it means retribution. Retribution, as in? Yes. Retribution means you get back what you have given. The bad that you have given. Therefore you retribute. And what do you retribute for? Ainangam, number seven. For your violence. Ainange means basically somebody who is violent. You remember 
when we dealt with it last time, it is part of the Kemna Mazda prayer. Just turn to it. 46.7. Page 246. And see word number 11 in the Kemna Mazda prayer. Ainange. Got it? Everybody got it? Yeah. yeah. You remember when we did the Kemna Mazda? So when you are threatened with violence, what do you do? Same thought here. All right. So retribution will come to those for their violent deeds. And when that happens, when God gives them enough suffering so that some degree of self-realization occurs, only then will Mazda's law be clearly revealed to them. Next two lines. At Mazda Taibiyok Shatrem. Then will the strength of Almighty God be revealed to them. And Vohumana, in turn. Vohumananga Vaividaite. Revealed. Then again we come to the word saste, which we've come across earlier, number 16, teaching. And notice the word zastayo, number 21. Hands. Zastaya means hands. The very opening verse of the Gathas speaks of Zoraster stretching out his hands with humility so that he can receive something from above. Ustano Zastaya Rafedraya. So, beautifully put, what do we do? When all this takes place, namely when retribution comes and the person realizes he's gone wrong, having been violent, finally, the parasitical part of evil will be delivered up onto what is good. So evil is only parasitical and will never last because ultimately the Lord gives enough in terms of a mind being able to realize it has gone wrong and then choose a right. That idea will come later. Then 30.9. You see, they shall, no, they meaning those who have gone wrong will deliver themselves up to truth. Themselves up. Now the, comes the idea again. Of a revolution taking place. The key word here is kere nauna and fareshem or other ferashem. Now, word number 8, if you see number 8 in 30.9, ferashem, the same as the English word fresh. Just put fresh down there. Fresh. What is the idea of fresh here in this context? To make new, fresh, renew. So, he says, I am about to bring about a revolution which will make things completely.